we're going to go a little bit more in depth for the purpose of an instructable on how do you use a real-time analyzer program or RTA to replace or supplement an oscilloscope and also to provide additional information as to the frequency response of the circuit under test. What do you need to get started? Well, first, you're going to need some sort of a computer or tablet. You can probably even use the mic input on your phone, but you need some sort of computerized device that has an audio input. Now you can use the headphone jack that comes on most computers or tablets, but you'll have to be very careful because of the input range. Or you can use an external sound card. You know, there's a couple here. I'm going to be using this one as far as the test results, simply because I like it. I'm lucky enough to have something that's as nice as that, but the device has outputs and it has inputs. Now we're going to be interested in looking at the inputs. I'm specifically going to use the RCA inputs labeled tape 1 and 2. Because what we want to show is how we can use low level RCA or line level inputs to measure the output of a circuit. Whether that's the output of an amplified circuit or a low level output. So what we're going to do for that example is I'm going to use a head unit and I'm going to look at the RCA outputs, so the low-level outputs, as well as the amplified speaker outputs. We're going to take a look at what that looks like with and without a line output converter. You need to always be careful that you understand the voltage input range of your audio input device, whether it's external sound card, or whether it's just a headphone jacks on the device. You need to make sure that you don't exceed that input voltage, and it's only going to be rated for a few volts. So if you're measuring anything that's got an amplified output on it, you're going to have to knock that down. You can do so with what we call a line output converter, which is essentially a either transformer based in this case, or it could be a resistor based voltage divider. This has speaker level inputs and RCA level outputs. I'm simply going to connect from here through this device to knock it down so it's a lower level and then connect that to the input of my sound card. Now, what are the applications of this? That's one of the primary questions. Well, first, I use this method, and I use the RTA function of this method to view the frequency response of a head unit or an amplifier. Factory OEM systems typically have equalization. We want to see what that looks like so we understand it. But the DIY community might be working with crossovers. Passive crossovers, maybe you have one, but you don't actually know what frequency range it actually attenuates at. Like, what's the crossover point and what's the slope? Well, it'd be great if you could see the output, and you can with this. So one of the tests I'm going to do for you is take the amplified output from the head unit, run it into a crossover, either the high pass or low pass outputs. I'll show you both. And then take those and run them through the line output, oh, the line output converter, of course, to knock it down to a safe voltage, bring it into the sound card, and we'll get to see. So we'll actually measure the crossover point of an aftermarket or, you know, could be OEM passive crossover. If you're building your own and you want to see exactly what you built, this method's great for that. If you have one, you want to decide if you can use it. This method's also great for that. Now remember, the crossover points are going to vary based on the impedance load that you put on them. So if you put a 8 ohm load versus a 4 ohm load, it's going to change that crossover point a little bit. We'll see what that result means. So that's the setup. All you really need is a computer, something to act as a sound card, whether it's the PC or an external. Some sort of a cable to connect the two of them together. It might have a 3.5 millimeter stereo. It might just be RCA inputs. And of course, something to knock that voltage down. If need be, you could always always have your DMM handy so that way you have an idea of what voltages, voltages you're working with. You might want to measure that. And because we have multiple gain relationships, I'll explain how having the digital multimeter will help when we go into an oscilloscope mode. So your oscilloscope mode on your real-time analyzer program is really what's going to allow this to take the place of that and give you the ability to take measurements to save results. In this program, you can save up to 20 measurements. So you might have an older scope that doesn't have any digital storage. Well, you can have access to that with just simply the same computer program you might be using to measure frequency anyway. All right, so we're ready to actually start our testing. I'm gonna turn the overhead off, uh, overhead light off when the time comes. So I got a doubled in head unit. That head unit is essentially wired in 
Uh, I just like using terminal strips. It gets power from DC distribution here. Just this is part of my test bench. But what matters for you is I have a laptop. As I mentioned before, I have it wired to a sound card. And the sound card and laptop communicate via USB. And then I have the amplified output from this head unit running into this passive crossover. The passive crossover input then is split in the crossover to high pass and low pass for tweeters and woofers. I do have a tweeter and a woofer wired up just so that way you can hear the signal as it's being measured. This line output converter then takes the speaker, amp speaker levels, knocks it down to low levels, and that's what comes into my sound card. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set this up so it stays steady. Turn off the overhead light so you can see what I'm doing. Now what we're going to start with first is uncorrelated pink noise. And I'm going to show you what the woofer output and what the tweeter output looks like. You're going to hear pink noise. I'm going to hit go. We'll set the averages at 10. Now remember, the longer you average, the better response you get. It's a little bit more smooth. So we're going to say stop. I'm going to save that as Alt 7, so that's preset 7. Now I'm going to go to the tweeter. I'm going to say go. Now we get the tweeter response. I'm going to say stop. I'm going to say Alt 8. And then I'm going to sum those up so you can see what the total combined response output from the crossover is. Let it average. Once it stops moving around a lot, hit stop. And then we'll say... Alt 9 for memory 9. Now we can stop the noise and now we can take a look and see our results. So what you see is we have the woofer trace, the tweeter trace, and the combined output between the two of them. So that's what the combined response is. And like I mentioned before, the primary reason here is for us to understand what is the crossover point. So we can take a look and we can see that this is about 3 kilohertz and we are about 12 dB down or so from the normalized tweeter output and roughly 12 or so down from the woofer output. They sum at the 3K point, but obviously they're gonna start an octave higher and an octave lower. So if you're looking to use a crossover like this for any other purpose and you're curious, is it safe for my tweeters? Well, if your tweeter can handle being 12 dB down at 3K and basically zero at 5K, then yes, it's the right choice. But this is again, one way that you can measure the amplified output from an amp amplifier, a head unit, a crossover and visualize that on this device. So now we're going to use the oscilloscope function within the RTA because this is pretty handy. We're going to use track 25 of AutoSound 2000 and that essentially gives you a clipped 50 hertz tone and it specifically clips between 14 and 18 seconds so you can see what that looks like. So we're at eight seconds now. So when you're setting gains on an amplifier, you're interested in seeing whether or not you're clipping. Now this is what the clipping distorted waveform looks like, and that's where it comes back. But you'll see, you know, that wasn't that obvious. You might have missed that on a traditional oscilloscope. Again, let's back up here. And what I'm going to do now is when it hits the, when it's fully clipping, I'm going to pause it, and then I'm going to save a measurement. So that way you can take a look and see what that looks like. So we know it clips between 14 and 18, so we're just going to simply wait for that clipping to be maximum. That's about maximum clipping. So that right there is what we would call max clipping. Again, we'll save that. Now let's go and see what it looks like under Spectrum Analyzer. And this is where I think you're going to find the most use in determining whether or not you have any, what your, if your signal's distorted. So let's say go... Let's restart the track. We've got a clean tone. We've got a clean tone. 12 seconds in. The tone's still clean. Then, as we clip, look at that. Look at all that distortion. So, essentially what that is, is that is harmonics. And that's one of the side effects. Let's say that is Alt-5. That's one of the side effects of clipping is that you create a lot of high frequency. Let's take a look at that again. So you're gonna create a lot of high frequency noise 
when you have clipping. So you would expect, and I got my averages turned up, so let's actually take those down. No clipping yet, no clipping yet. And just at the onset of clipping, suddenly you start to see all those extra harmonics come into the signal. And then, it, once the clipping stops, you see them go away. You would expect to see harmonics with a simple tone, but you don't expect to see a lot of extra harmonics. So that's essentially one of the benefits that you can get from this RTA. You get the oscilloscope function and you get the RTA function, but you get to see what your signal looks like, your audio signal. Now let's go ahead and go to uncorrelated pink noise so you can see what a flat frequency response would look like. Remember, we're just going back to this. This is the output from the crossover with summation. So remember, we're summing left and right. If we go to just right, we see the woofer. And if we go to just left, we see the tweeter. In a portion of the previous section, I show clipping, and it doesn't look like the clipping that I think you're typically used to seeing. So let me show you, I'm going to put up a graphic that identifies what the AutoSound 2000 Test CD 102 Track 25, which says that it clips between 14 and 18 seconds, the what that looks like. So you can see we have the clipped version and the unclipped version, and that looks like what most of you are kind of used to seeing as far as clipping is concerned. So then the question becomes, why do we not see that when we're running the head unit output? So what's happening at some point along the way, that, that clipping of that sine wave isn't translating to what we're measuring. So there's a couple of reasons for that. Part of it could be inductance. Part of it could be just the way that that signal is reproduced from an amplifier. So let's take a look at that again real quick. So that's the signal. And we're at 32 seconds. Let's back it up. Now what these two outputs are, and we'll pause it again when we see it. So that's what we're talking about. And as you know, in the previous section, I showed you what the harmonics look like in that kind of content. What you're typically used to seeing is where we go back to that graphic, where it gets cut off. Now, what I'm looking at in these two traces is I wanted to see if maybe we were getting some inductance or basically the, the inductance that's inherent within the transformer in the line output converter. So if you remember, we're going from the head unit into this crossover, and from the crossover, we're coming through a line output converter that has uh, transformers in it. In addition, we have a inductor as part of the high pass filter. So first thing I did is said, all right, let's take a look at just the signal that's coming in before the crossover, right? So that's essentially right channel, and that's going to be trace number one. That's the blue trace on top. Then I said, let's take a look at the direct output from the head unit. So I took it directly from the head unit and brought it over into the line input on this. Now, thing to remember is that this is a balanced output. All head units are essentially balanced. You can think of a head unit as an 8-channel amplifier bridged down to 4. That means there's signal on both positive and negative cables. That's why you can't ground these. So if you were to just run, you can see I got, basically I have this split off, and I'm generating a different chassis ground. So this is looking for an unbalanced input. That means that the shield has to be ground, and the center pin can be signal. The balanced inputs on this are the XLR inputs. I don't really feel like cutting one up right now, so I figured what I would do, and just also to explain to you, if you want to measure the output of a factory amplifier directly, you're really only looking at one of the two leads. You're not taking positive and negative, because if you do that, you're probably going to short out or ground out or induce voltage on the shield of your audio device. But that's essentially what we get when we play that track and look at it. And as I mentioned before, if you're playing a clip track to try and hear it, you can hear what clipping sounds like. You can hear those harmonics. But that signal itself, what it looks like, there's multiple styles of clipping. You can clip early on in an audio signal, and it won't look like your traditional kind of clipped off sine wave. It might just look like distortion, like this. So that's where changing over to the spectrum view can really help you see what's going on. Now I mentioned that you're going to want to 
characterize the voltage relationship between your sound card gain, your laptop gain, and the output. So what you'll do is you'll take a multimeter, and in this case this multimeter is measuring the outputs, the output voltage, leaving the crossover. So I get to measure the voltage as it's coming onto the head unit. And then I can compare that with my volts per division and the gain that I have on the sound card. Now I can adjust the sound card volume and you'll see I adjust the signal. So if you want to actually use your oscilloscope to accurately measure voltage, you have to characterize it first. So you're going to measure with your DMM the output voltage directly from whatever it is you're interested in, and then compare that to the measurement that you're getting at the oscilloscope. Now keep in mind the difference between peak, peak to peak, and true RMS. So if you have a true RMS volt voltmeter that this is, then I know I'm right now measuring 0.711, RMS volts. Now what you look at on your oscilloscope, you're going to have to convert that from RMS to peak or peak to peak. So then that way you can set your volts per division. Now what I recommend is come up with a relationship that makes sense, right? Try to get to a gain relationship that's an even number, some sort of an integer. 10 to 1 is awesome. It's really easy to measure with a 10 to 1. But of course that's going to be relative to what you have for capabilities of your actual signal and your gain there. But since you can adjust this gain pretty accurately, you can come up with a measurement that will correlate pretty well. So again, measure your voltage, know what it's gonna be coming into your sound card, know what you're gonna drop it to, and then characterize that if you wanna use your oscilloscope to accurately measure voltage.